Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Thought Leader Series, sponsored by the Masters in Positive Organization Development and Change Program, affectionately known as MPOD, at the Case Western Reserve University's Weatherhead School of Management. Today is our first webinar in our 2003 series, or 23 series, sorry, and we are honored to welcome Nadia Zexandayeva as she presents three big friends that are reshaping the field of organization development. Our relationship with Nadia began in 2001 when she joined our doctoral program in organizational behavior. She completed her PhD in 2008 and became the associate director of the Fowler Center for the Business as an Agent of World Benefit. And she also taught in our MPOT program. I believe Nadia continues to stay connected to us by serving as the Fowler Center um, Board of Advisors. She is also a business owner, an educator, speaker, and author, and specializes in reinvention. She is often referred to as the reinvention guru or the queen of reinvention. So without further introduction, I'm going to turn it over to you, Nadia, and thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Pat, for the warm welcome and the intro. It's so, so good for me to be back home. For me, Weatherhead, the Department of OB, uh, is my intellectual home. And to this day, it's the place where I feel extremely alive and um, it does feel very safe and very homey. And I do know Pat for 21 years. So she met me. I was a baby. She saw my newborn baby brought to the classroom because I kept bringing Lila when she was born and uh, my daughter is in college now. So it's just a, a remarkable gift that uh, OB department, the Empath program and Case Western continues to be in the world and in my personal life. So it's incredible honor. Uh, the series for me is a special gift because the series show you the different sizes, fields, implications, applications, dimensions of the field of organizational behavior and development. Because uh, OB and OD, OD is a uh, applied part uh, of theory of OB. Um, the field itself can be thought through many lenses, and one of them is the scale of the system. And we apply it at the level of an individual. The system is a person where we study things such as motivation. It applies to the level of a group, group dynamics. Um, we apply it to the level of larger systems, organizations, leadership, and so on. And then larger and larger systems, industries, communities, countries, and civilization as a whole. And just the two speeches, the two talks that will be one next to another, which is my talk, is at the largest level of scale. I'm going to talk about trends at the level of human civilization. And it's next to an incredible, incredible teacher of mine, Dr. Richard Bayatis, who will speak about narcissism next time, which is at the level of individual and group. And I think that's the beauty of this talk series and the beauty of the uh, Department of Organizational Behavior and specifically the MPOT program, that you can find your entrance, whatever excites you. Uh, if you are thinking at the level of a super large system and you're excited by the development of the human civilization and the human condition, you have a place in MPOT program. But also if you are thinking at the level of an individual or a group or a department or a business unit, it's perfectly adequate application as well. And these two talks together, my talk and Richard's talk next month is a perfect illustration of the multitude of dimensions that you can find here. And that's why I'm so excited to see over a hundred of you here because all of you are a different uh, dimension all of you represent a different lens and i am incredibly honored that we can bring that richness together to think about what's the next stage for the field of organizational development and what is the world asking us to do what's the call of our times what is the world and the time we're living in calling us as professionals in the field of organizational development to do what is the call of our time for od and i hope this 
will start the conversation. I do not uh, intend to answer that question. I intend to help us structure the context and the question itself better so we can collectively evolve and discover that question and the answer to that question. From my end, as we announced, uh, I want to share three trends. They're not the only trends. They're not the absolute set of trends, and they're not necessarily even correct. Uh, every trend, as you know, from the field of science is just a hypothesis. This is the best hypothesis we have at the moment. This is the best hypothesis I have at the moment, and I, I'm sure it will evolve. But the hope is that I can share three trends that hopefully will help you ask yourself, what does it mean for me and my work? Uh, where do I go from here? Uh, do I even see this trends as resonating or I'm ready to evolve my own set of trends and work from there. And before we get started, let me very quickly ask who is in the room. I am, I'm honored you're here. I would love to know who is here. So there are many different reasons why people join this kind of um, sessions. Reason number one, you are a professional in a corporate or nonprofit sector and you are here because you want to safeguard your career and your organization, you want to find new ideas. If that is your reason, you are number one. Um, when I will ask you uh, to share who do you represent. Another reason is uh, you are speaker, consultant, coach, trainer, and you're here to look for new insights, perhaps new tools that are more reflective of the current needs, whether of your clients or your own practice. And that's why you're here. Or perhaps you're a business owner outside of coaching consulting field, and you are here because you want to safeguard your baby in this new world that is clearly changing somewhere. So if you can share in the chat uh, what describes you the best, one, two, or three, but it's happy to be, it can be both, right? It can be a combination. So I see some twos, I see some ones. Uh, great. I begin to see some combinations. Chris is one and two. Emily is one and two. Uh, great. Uh, there are more and more of us uh, who are coming in a combination. So I call us slash people. I'm myself a slash person. Uh, slash person means that behind my name, there is author slash business owner slash scientist slash and I think more and more of us, because of the world we live in, becoming slash people like Terry is uh, clearly putting slashes between uh, her different roles. And there's a more of us. Beautiful. So this helps me set the stage. We're a pretty diverse group of people. Whatever is the reason you are here, I'm incredibly honored. I'm thankful you decided to take this time. And I'm hoping to make it as precise and as pragmatic as possible while the topic is generally speaking very, very philosophical. And to show my bias, as I come from a non-neutral space, we are never neutral. At least I live in the world of social construction, so I do not believe we are able to escape the biases we bring from our bringing, from our culture. You can all hear I have an accent, so you can all guess that I'm probably not born in the U.S., there's a lot of um, background, there's a context that is shaping my thinking and everything I say is shaped by uh, the context in which I live and work. I want to make that context as explicit as I can. So you are aware of my bias and you are fully informed where I'm coming from. So my bias and my relationship with the field of organizational development happened before that day in 2001, 21 years ago, when I joined the Department of Organizational Behavior for my PhD program. It actually happened long before I was born. It happened about 100 years ago um, when um, in my country, my family was going through a traumatic experience. In the late 1920s, early 1930s, the government of my country, Soviet Union, decided to cleanse uh, my ethnicity, my, um, my group of people, which is Kazakh people. And uh, artificial famine was created by government specifically to clear up the territory that could be repopulated. As a result of that process, 40% of all Kazakh people were murdered. And this reality is not widely known. Recently, there was a beautiful article in the 
um, Wall Street Journal describing uh, the reality and why uh, this is not exactly the most known fact, but it was not known to me as well. Until the collapse of Soviet Union, it was not very safe to speak about it. Um, if I, as a child, I was uh, not careful to mention that in my kindergarten, my parents could have faced severe consequences. So until I was a mature teenager after the collapse of the Soviet Union, this was not even uh, known to me. What was known to me, however, is the world in which I grew up. Uh, when I grew up in Kazakhstan in the Soviet Union era, we did not face mass murder. But we did face extreme shortages, for example, basic food supplies. Um, my responsibility in my family was sour cream. So every Saturday I would stand for four to five hours in line between 5 a.m. and 9 a.m. to get sour cream, whether it's minus 40 or plus 40, I would still stand in line. And it was our reality that shaped my existence. So when the Soviet Union collapsed in the 1901, I was absolutely sure that people will look at that change as something positive, that they will rejoice. After decades of standing in line for sour cream and hot dogs, after decades of gulags, concentration camps, mass murders, and everything you can imagine, I was 100% sure that this will be perceived as a game. And boy, was I wrong. At the time of collapse, Kazakhstan was so unprepared that it took us almost three years to develop our own currency. We had no capabilities to do so. We had no government. We had no institutions. We had nothing. We were completely not prepared for this new world. And people were incredibly, incredibly upset. They were so resistant to change that we had a massive spike of suicides. People would rather kill themselves because they were not able to face the unknown reality. And for them, unknown reality was worse than known torture. They would rather live in gulags and concentration camps and no food that face the unknown reality. And that was my first big wake up call. And when I started my research as a part of the um, uh, PhD program, and I started looking at companies that were one after another killing themselves. I felt like I was looking at a sort of deja vu. And this time it was not individuals who were murdering themselves because they are refusing to face the unknown reality. It was whole organizations. One after another, it was self-inflicted suicide. So those of you who are in the chat active, can you tell me please, why do you think Kodak faced the collapse after owning the market. Kodak at the peak had over 90% market share of the film. Why do you think Nokia was able to go from the peak and the top of the market to almost no existence? And from the point of view of a business owner, both of those companies are dead and they're building a new set of companies. So in the chat, give me a word or two. Why did Kodak disappear? Why did Nokia disappear? I see paradigm paralysis. I see failed to adapt, suffered overconfidence, binds, unwilling to kill, kill their own product, and didn't give credence to digital photography, right? So often when we look at these places, the first place where I go to, and a lot of place uh, where companies themselves go to, is the assumption that it's technical or technological issue that they were not looking at. So Kodak, they didn't look at the digital photography. Nokia, they didn't look at the smartphones and on and on and on. Blockbuster didn't look at the new technology. The reality when you actually start analyzing the cases is not supporting that assumption because Kodak was the inventor of digital photography. This was a product of their own laboratory. And Nokia had a quite a healthy, robust portfolio of smartphones at the time of their fall from grace. So most of the time, it's not necessarily the hard things that are missing, but it's something else. Many of you are speaking about the ability to change. It's the overconfidence. It's not collaborating. But rarely, it's the technical or technological issue. Most of them either have it in a possession or in the easy access. They choose 
not to engage with the technical and technological innovation. And this question, this big question, why do some individuals face disruption and are able to grow and thrive in it while others are completely disintegrating? Why do some companies look at a disruptive context and grow and thrive in it and others like the ones you see on your screen are collapsing and why some civilizations, whole countries are looking at the disruption and are disintegrating. That was the case with my country and while others are able to rebuild and reinvent, that has been the beginning of my quest in research since 2001 and it continues to this day. It took me on a roller coaster. I always speak about being a recovering academic. I'm definitely a recovering academic. I had, as Pat said, a luxury of serving in a research center as an associate director. I moved on to serve as a Coca-Cola chaired professor of strategy and sustainability. I had the luxury of growing a family. My daughter is almost 19. I had the luxury of building my own business and my own educational institution, Reinvention Academy. But all of it was in the quest of answering that question. Why do we, some of us, are able to use incredible, horrific disruption and actually grow from it while others are disappearing. We work with massive number of companies. We also are fully in the field of competition. We partner with our competition. We cooperate with our competitors quite heavily. And starting our own reinvention agency 15 years ago, we grew to a big global mission, which is now a, a pro bono, and um, most of it is actually um, uh, a philanthropic mission, our goal is to bring 1 billion people the skills of resilience and reinvention so we are able to thrive in uncertainty. So that is my bias and that is my context. And with that context, I want to get us into the three trends we discuss. The trend number one that I want to speak about, and I want us to look at the scientific understanding of chaos. I don't think you can conquer or befriend chaos if you don't fully understand what chaos is, trend number one that is absolutely present, that is shaping the present and the future of the field of organizational development is the chaotic reality in which we live. And of course, when I started speaking about it, um, especially when I spoke about it in 2020, majority assumed that I'm speaking about this. And uh, yes, that is one tiny symptom of a larger whole. In 2020, at the beginning of COVID, every time I would do a talk, I would ask people, do you believe that COVID was a black swan? Uh, and I will remind you, definition of black swan, uh, black swan is something that is completely unpredictable and completely unforeseeable. So do you believe that COVID was a black swan? If you can give me one, if you believe it's a yes, and two, if you believe it, it's a no, you can also just type yes or no. Many of you are saying two, no, so it's no, it's not a black swan. Actually, not uh, almost nobody speak about yes. There's a couple of yeses. In 2020, 90% of answers were yes. 90, we are very wise in the hindsight, but in the moment in 2020, about, I would say, 2,000 people in our sample would say yes, uh, this was a black swan event. And of course, from a point of view of pure data, it was not. We've been foreseeing, we've been predicting, we've been forecasting the presence of epidemics and the growth of viral infection for many, many years. Few months before COVID, the World Economic Forum's risk map was clearly showing the spread of infectious diseases as something that is highly likely and highly impactful, but is not even the greatest problem we should pay attention to. It's absolutely foreseeable. It's absolutely predictable. Even more striking is that the risks that have been published last week, these are the top 10 risks that WEF has published last week. Uh, in the two-year horizon, these are not risks. These are realities. You can put a check mark on all of them. Cost of living crisis, inflation, it's a check mark. Natural disasters, it's a check mark. Geoeconomic confrontation, a war, it's a check mark. Failure to mitigate the climate, it's a check mark. These are not risks and these are not forecasts. These are just facts. These are the new facts of our reality. And it's not just the 
health or epidemics. It's not just um, wars that we're talking about. It's not just climate change that we're um, clearly all facing with the weather disruption. Of course, it all accumulates in the field that hurts the daily life, which is the economic reality. So let me check your bias. In your view, and if you know this data from my books or from somewhere else, uh, I ask you not to give it away. In your view, your gut reaction. This is not a Googleable fact moment. You don't need to Google it. Your gut reaction. Give me a number in the chat. In your view, how many economic recessions took place since 1988? And while you are typing, I'll remind you that economic recession is defined as a shrinking of the economy by 20% within a particular system, which could be a country, a region, an industry, or the world at large. So the question is, how many do you think happened since 1988? There's seven, 20 plus, three, 14, 11, 42, 46, 15. There's uh, 500, there's four, eight, and seven. Um, there's a big range, but most of you, aside from couple who come from our field uh, and know the number, factual number, all of you are speaking about relatively small number, under 20, and actually most of you under 10. The data is actually completely, completely different. So if you look at the economic recessions, since 1988, if we only look at the uh, country level recessions, we had 469. If we add to this regional industry and world recession, currently we're talking about about one recession every week. And it used to be that it was very easy to say, if a particular country has a recession, who cares? Um, I'm detached from it. I see no impact. If the Democratic Republic of Congo has a recession, who cares? But Democratic Republic of Congo produces almost all of the cobalt that goes into our mobile devices. The whole agenda of the green economy, if we're going into mitigation of other risks, because all of them are interconnected. There's no an economic problem separate from environmental problem. There's no environmental problem separate from social problem. They're deeply interconnected. You cannot go into green economy without cobalt. You cannot do a lot of things without cobalt because cobalt is what makes our batteries small and compact. And if there is a recession in Congo, every single one of us feels it. That's part of the driver of where we are right now with the inflation. Same with anything else we touched. Every item, every issue is deeply interconnected and we're living in the world where it's disruption, whether we're talking about environmental, social, economic, whatever facet we're experiencing, it's actually a symptom of the same whole, of the same core issue. Uh, the Any number of issues you take, all of them have a social um, implication, environmental implication, economic implication, political equity implication, war implication, and on and on and on. Every single one of them is shaping the reality. And when we look at the world where we are facing economic recession once a week, environmental collapse once a week, social unrest once a week, if it's not a recession, it's an environmental disaster. If it's not climate change, it's a war. If it's not a war, it's a social unrest. If it's not social unrest, it's a new competitor. If it's not a new competitor, it's new technology. If it's not new technology, it's new regulation. But it's every day something. There's no wonder that the data around the uncertainty is changing the context in which the practice of organizational development has to exist. Uh, the World Economic Forum tracks the global index of uncertainty for over 60 years since 1959. And you can see that we're currently living in a world that is about 100 times more uncertain than the world of late 70s and early 80s. Uh, the decades of 70s and 80s, uh, also 60s, we are talking about magnitude of change that is unbelievable. This is 10 times, nine times more uncertain times. But what's important when we talk about our field, what is crucial here when we talk about our field, and I will remove the slides and just uh, speak about it from the kind of from my heart, the crucial thing that we forget, that most of what we developed 
in the field of OB and OD as most of what we developed in the field of strategy, marketing, HR, almost every assumption about the way our organizations live were born in that era of extreme stability. And when we lived in the era of extreme stability, when we had an era of a very, very certain low volatility environment, in that context, it was very easy to negate the impact of your actions because your actions were separated from the consequences of your actions. When you live in a very slow world where changes happen slowly, your action towards environment, your action towards society, your action towards your competitors is separated by years, sometimes decades uh, from you making that decision. So it shapes your reality completely different. This completely changes the nature, but it also changes the foundations on which our science is developed. Most of strategy was developed at a time of relative stability with the assumption that stability is a norm and disruption is rarity, that change happens very, very rarely. And most of the development of theory of change, notice from the beautiful work of Carter to all of the more recent work, it's all based on the idea of a project. You do change as a project. You There's a starting point, there's a middle side, there's a finish line, there's unfreezing, there's a change, there's a refreezing. We live in the world where change was rare, therefore it was a project that you do once every 30, 40 years. And that applies to every single field. Almost every field that is guiding our decision-making right now was built in the era of relative stability, where the fundamental beliefs and the reality on which we built our theory was very different. Now, however, the world that we spoke about is becoming a very volatile, uncertain, and chaotic world, and the companies are simply not surviving it, and the theories that we use to help companies deal with it are not anymore relevant and valid. So data is very clear. If you look at the past titans of business, 88% of the original Fortune 500 list are already gone. But looking forward, about 50% of Standard & Poor 500 are supposed to be of the list, are forecasted to be of the list uh, by 2027 in the next five years. And even when you reach the peak in your industry, so you're climbing to the peak of the industry, if in the past reaching the peak meant that you're guaranteed at least five years of easy life, you climb, 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 you got the peak and you're like, Phew, I can breathe out, I can relax, now it's a business as usual, now we just roll with it. It's no longer the case. Very few companies are able to maintain any kind of leadership positions. And that number is actually falling from 77 to 44 and less. And the number that breaks my heart as a person who lives and work in the field of change, the number that has been tracked by Carter in the 90s, by McKinsey in 2010, and now by BCG in 2019, it's not getting better, it's actually getting worse. Currently, about 75% of all transformation efforts are failing. It was, it used to be about 70, we just got a little bit of worse, which is clear indication that we cannot keep going the way we're going, that something is fundamentally off in the field, and our approach to change has to change. That assumptions that we build into theory and then translate into practice are all no longer relevant. And that bleeds us to, brings us to the question of a chaotic world, this new reality in which we live, in which uh, economic crisis is once a week, environmental crisis is once a day, where or more or a constant, where political crisis is constant, where social unrest is constant, when war is coming to backyards of the safe regions, uh, as we see now in my home region of Ukraine and Russia and Kazakhstan, of course, is heavily engaged in that. Now we're living in a world which is absolutely defined from the point of view of science as a chaotic world. So can you give me in the chat your answer to the question, just a word or, or word or two 
uh, what is the what comes to your mind when you hear the course the word crisis as you are typing up i will actually very quickly answer to heather's question uh on the source of this statistics uh, it's very easy for you to download all this data uh we made it easily available so i'll just put a list link here uh heather where you can download and get the references necessary but as you are typing your answers as you're typing your answers, um, what is the just mental association with the word chaos? What comes to your mind? Hidden opportunities, unpredictable, unknown, overwhelm, unknown, motion towards entropy, uh, uncertainty, pervasive uncertainty, uncertainty, whirlwind, uh, part of adaptive system, uh disorganized destruction disorganized destruction lack of control dysfunction uncertainty entropy while you notice there are war right uh while you notice there are a couple of uh, words that you would put in a positive category um, most of the associations with the word chaos are highly negative and as I was researching this um, and trying to understand if the reality we're living in is looking like a chaotic system, what are the underpinnings from the point of view of science, from point of view of math that studies chaos extensively, point of view of physics, point of view of chemistry, and point of view of biology? What is chaos? And Glenn says random, right? Random, lack of control, lack of order. While researching this area, one definition, and there are many great definitions, but one metaphor that struck a chord for me is a metaphor from a geneticist, from a biologist, Lipton. And he speaks about uh, the New York City's Grand Central, a train station. So his metaphor is the following. When you look at the typical, typical train station like this one, in front of you is a chaotic system. And every person in that system, seemingly, um, the, everything that is going on in that picture is a seemingly complete random lack of order. There is no certainty. You don't know who will go where. You cannot predict what's going on with that. Uh, it's incredibly hard to forecast. People are moving in the opposite directions. They are in diagonal straight. You cannot really understand what's going on. And this is, according to Lipton, a true definition of chaos. Um, but chaos is not disorder because each individual player in this system is moving with a purpose, with the rules, with direction, and with an order. Every single person has a paradigm within which they live and work. Some of them are moving towards trains. Some are moving away from trains. Some are meeting up with their friends. Some are buying tickets. There is purposefulness there. There is uh, direction. There is a lot of order. There's a lot of predictability for each individual player. What would be a true disorder, true uncertainty, true um, lack of control. If I take a megaphone, stand on those stairs and start screaming fire, fire, and people start moving in a random fear-based action with no purpose and no direction, that would be disorder. That would be lack of control. That would be uncertainty. Chaos is not lack of order. And that's where the definition that I find most helpful in my work comes from, Chaos is not the absence of order. Chaos is a presence of more than one order. Chaos is not an absence of order. From the point of view of true science, chaos is a presence of more than one order. And um, that's a funny thing to say, true science. Uh, and that tells you a lot about social construction and paradigms in which we live. So that's a, that's a bit of a funny side joke here that we could go into whole discussion on give you an example as we are exiting post-covid reality or pre-covid or i don't know where we are anymore the specific reality of are we working in an office are we in a hybrid are we in face-to-face -face? are we in uh flexible are we fully virtual this is a presence of multiple orders because the paradigm of we are all coming to an office lives and works in one set of rules 
And thriving in that paradigm may or may not match thriving in a paradigm we all work virtually. We are now living in reality where organizational development and change needs to practice development for multiple orders simultaneously, multiple paradigms, one set of rules and realities and efforts for virtual, one set of rules and realities for those who are in the office, one set of realities for hybrid, and all of them can coexist in one organization. We're living in a world where in one organization, we, by definition, need to assume multiple cultures. Because if one business unit is in a startup stage of their product and another one is in a mature stage of the product, everything around the culture of that or business unit within the same organization has to be very different. We're closer and closer into true chaotic systems and organizational development as a field has to produce new theory and new practice that fits that reality. And unfortunately, we're not doing that very well, which brings me to trend number two. For the longest time, change has been perceived as a project. And it's been an objective uh, reality in which we live because the context in which the theory of change in the field has developed was a very predictable reality. So what do I mean by that? When we look at the typical life cycle of a system, it can be a human being. It can be, um, let me see, do I have a cycle here? No, did I forget the cycle? When I probably have a cycle, I will just stop the share very quickly. Every living system goes through a typical, typical cycle. Every living system is cyclical, things got it would be a very, very sad and dangerous reality if we would stand and stick in one reality here we go. So when we live in a cyclical reality, whether it's a human being, whether it's in a business model, whether it's a product life cycle, we all live in a life cycle. We go from a low level of performance to medium to high. So if we talk about a human being, if we are measuring my strength as a baby, that would be a human baby being at a startup stage. As a baby, I can do zero push-ups. With time, I can develop more and more strength and reach full maturity where I can do 100 push-ups. And if nothing happens and if I'm not um, working on it actively, generally speaking, most systems move towards entropy with a decline of the peak performance. It's a natural life cycle. There's nothing new in this theory. We've been researching it for a long time. Plenty of authors work on that. And plenty of authors study so-called S-curves, the idea that in organizational life and in a career of an individual, we don't need to move into decline. We can start a new S-curve and a new S-curve and a new S-curve indefinitely. That is the essence of reinvention, is starting the new cycle, finding a new level of growth, developing a new direction direction. And that has been uh, present in the effort of every transformation system. Starting a new S-curve is the goal of transformation. What we have not tracked, however, is how often we need to do that. And when we started looking at the data on the cycles, what we discovered is that for most of the history of the modern economy, and definitely for most of the theory development in the field of organizational development and behavior, we lived in a world of very long cycles. So for a typical business model, currently I'm talking about data on business models. In a typical business model, a typical median for the business models around the world, the life cycle was 75 years. I could have a startup if I'm successful at every stage and it peaks to the level of peak performance as a mature cash cow is a mature organization and nonprofit, mature performing nonprofit, um, that on average would take us 30 to 40 years. And I could stay in that cycle for a significant period of time. That also meant that as an individual, I could graduate from my alma mater, Case Western Reserve University, enter your company, work in your company 30 years, leave your company for retirement and never see a single transformation in my life. That means all of our education systems were educating people for long cycles. I was educated in the Soviet Union. My daughter started first grade in Slovenia. 
She finished high school and started first year in college in the United States. And regardless of the economic system, political system, religious system, or whatever else, her and me and everyone around me, unless we were super, super lucky and we were homeschooled or we went to a special school, on the first day of school, we were all taught the same thing. Sit down and shut up. Sit down and shut up. Sit down and shut up. Not because there's any sort of conspiracy or something mean happening. In the world of long cycles, creativity is unnecessary appendix. It's a disruption. In a world where we get a business model to start uh, reaching the scale level and then just replicating the same set of activities and focusing on incremental efficiencies in that world, creativity is unnecessary and transformation happens once every 40 years. That's why most of transformation skills were outsourced to few houses around the world. If you are reinventing every 40 years, why would you have that in-house? Why would you put in expenses? The same thing as if you um, if you have one marriage per life cycle, why would you have all the wedding skills, tools, and um, assets in your house for 40 years? Of course, you would outsource it to a wedding planner. There's no reason for that. There's no reason to have everything in-house. And that's where we lift from a theory point of view, loan cycles. That's where strategic planning comes from. Most of the theory of strategic planning, the entire school of deliberate a strategy comes from long cycles. You can set the parameters and just stick to it. Worked great in a stable world. The problem with that, however, is that late 1980s, early 1990s, we suddenly had a massive jump. This is a combination of both globalization, because we are full of Berlin Wall, the opening of China, full of the Soviet Union, true globalization, combined with a dot-com tech boom. And suddenly, from very long cycles, we went to a cycle of 15 and falling. And that continued until about post-Iraq war, uh, active stage of Iraq war, so about 2002, 2003, 2005, we went to 15, and from 15, 2005, even shorter. So what's your guess? If you can put in the chat, what would be your guess? What is the average median life cycle of a business today, of a typical business model right now? What would be your number? John says three, five, seven, two, seven, three. You're all absolutely correct, by the way. Three, five, seven, two, two, two. I see more two. Maybe somebody else. I see three. Great. Uh, anybody else? Anybody else? For some startups, it's month. You're absolutely right, Paul. Six to three, five to three. We are actually finishing up the analysis of the data for our most current research in 2022, and we will announce it on Thursday in the Global Alliance of Reinvention Professionals. But I'll show you the data for 2018 and 2020 because we do this every two years. And here's the data. You're all completely correct. It is, of course, dependent on the industry and the context. Sometimes in dynamic markets, your cycle shrinks because of the market. And of course, certain industries, the ones that are closest to the end consumer, usually change faster than, let's say, extractive industries. But notice the jump. In 2018, about 14% of companies were reinventing every 12 months or less. In 2020, about 16% of companies were reinventing every 12 months or year, years. And I already know from 2022 research, over 20% of companies last year were reinventing. Every fifth company reinventing every 12 months or less. If we live in the world of that speed, reinvention simply can no longer be a project. It's like going from... Change is a wedding that we produce once every 30 years to change is taking a shower. If I don't take a shower on a regular basis, I begin to stink. If I don't wash out my products, my services, if I don't wash out my paradigms, if I don't wash out my beliefs, if I don't wash out my partnerships on a regular basis, I begin to stink. And this shift from change is a project to change as a process is one of the hardest shifts that we are seeing right now in the field of organizational development. Because to this day, almost every theory we've developed 
is one, a stage-based theory. It's a linear theory. It's the idea that change goes from A to B to C in a linear fashion. Think about Carter models, think about Atkar model, think about every mother, go to the theory, original theory of Kurt Lewin. All of it was stage theory. Uh, it was linear in assumption and it was always project based. There's a beginning, there's an end, we're done. Living in the world of change as a process requires completely different set of assumptions. I'll give you an implication from a different field, supply chain management. You all remember the glory of the years of just-in-time management. Beautiful idea, just-in-time management. You do not need an inventory on file inside your company, inside your warehouse until you're going to use it. Bring the part to exactly just in time when you're going to use it. Ship it to the customer exactly when the customer needs it. Do not keep the inventory. Beautiful concept. Worked like magic in stable times. In the cycle of 75 years, beautiful concept. In the cycle of six and less, look at what it's done to us in the last couple of years. Supply chain management suddenly is a mainstream news. <laughs> now everyone knows about supply chain management because our assumptions are no longer fitting our reality and we are not catching on. And one of the biggest implications because the field of organizational development is of course heavily engaged in the bigger world. It's not just economic theory. This is environment. This is climate change. This is social justice. This is every other facet of human condition. One of the biggest implications of long cycles, when you live in a cycle of 75 years, your decision is separated from the impact of that decision, sometimes by decades. The climate change we're experiencing now is decisions of 20s and 30s and 40s. The decisions of 2023, the implications, yes, the system is much more robust and it's giving us feedback much more right now, but living in the long cycles, we are simply separated mentally from implications of our own decisions. And we lost the capacity to even track how our decision produces impacts. We actually theoretically put those impacts outside of theory and call them externalities. That is the concept we believe in. Yeah, this is where we act. Externality is separate from us. We're not going to take it into account because the conditions allowed us to live in that world. In a long cycle reality, it was possible to pretend that the implications and consequences of your decisions are not there. They are externalities. There's no externality anymore. There's no other uh, in the world of some scientists, the ocean right now is like a giant, giant toilet that doesn't flush. There is nothing there. There's nowhere to throw away. There's no way to throw. And that is the new reality that we are heavily waking up to. But from the point of view of theory, we are not catching on. The amount of work done in terms of theoretical research, in terms of framework development, is not adequate to the world where change happens every day and has to move in the dimension of process. This has implication for our field directly, of course. And the median in 2020 was six. I would assume we're somewhere close, just the distribution is slightly different in 2022, but this is a direct implication for our field. So after this session, I invite you to do a little exercise. Take a piece of paper, you can do it in your community, you can do it in your company, you can do it with your classroom if you are a professor. Take uh, the long cycle world and take the short cycle world. These are two very different paradigms and try to write down what are the rules of the game for that world? We will do it for just one question. Do this for the rest. But let's start with the first question. What kind of skills and capabilities are needed to survive and thrive in this reality? For the 75-year reality, only for the 75-year reality, can you put in the chat what skills were crucial for the long cycle world? In the 75 reality, long cycle world, what do you believe were the crucial skills? Yeah, project management. Yeah, that was very important. Uh, project management. Loyalty as an as a approach. Expertise, narrow, deep expertise. Vanya says control, absolutely. A systems, almost everything we developed 
for the loan cycles were the systems of control. Because in loan cycles, you develop a model of behavior, standard operating procedure. And the most important thing is sticking to it. So policies, controls, um, every kind of hierarchical systems, efficiencies, uh, Six Sigma, and so on, everything to make sure that we stay as close as possible to the ideal behavior, because that ideal behavior stays relevant for 20, 30, 40 years. Planning, incredibly important skill for long cycle world. Now, short cycle world, six years and less. Can you put in the chat, what are the skills and capabilities that are crucial today? Agility, project management still very crucial, absolutely. From not alone, from a different point of view, flexibility, resilience, innovation, diversity, and on and on and on. Sustainability mindset, system thinking, crucial, crucial systems thinking, because in a long cycle, you can slowly change one element of a system and the impact to the greater system and the ecosystem reaches slowly. So you have a chance to work within a silos. In a short cycle world, you move here, the immediate impact is felt somewhere else. So system thinking, right? Comfortable with ambiguity, self-development, right? Uh, trust, trust as a competence. How do we build trust? Collaboration, extreme collaboration, experimentation, quality of failure, quality of testing, quality of experiments, and on and on and on. These are two completely different worlds that live by completely different rules. The problem is, and I'm sure you are facing that reality as well, when we enter an organizational setting, which world do they live in? Which world do they live in right now? Are they mindset-wise in a 75-year world? Or are they mindset-wise in a short, short cycle world? Long cycle world or short cycle world? Where are you sitting? Where are you feeling the organizations? And this is the, the crucial issue. Most companies I see, unfortunately, are still waiting for things to normalize since 2008 economic crisis. It's been 15 years. And most companies to this day are waiting for things to go back to normal. As if this is some passing, we will just swim out and then it will be stable again and predictable again, and the rules will not change all the time. It will not be a multi-order chaotic system. It will be a single order linear system and on and on and on. Most company, unfortunately, currently, are still hoping and operating with an idea that the long cycle world is just about to come back. I had this conversation with a CEO not that far ago, a massive company organization integrated, has a retail, massive retail in Europe, and also produces some of their own produce in agriculture. And the CEO says, Nadia, you work with a lot of banks. Can you tell me something? When we produce a five-year plan, when we're getting the new loans, when we're getting the financing, and we're writing that five-year plans, and we put like 100 people on that five-year plan, and everyone is working, and writing that big document and submitting it to the bank. We know it's crap. We know it's complete rubbish because every assumption we put in that document, it's an assumption about inflation. It's an assumption about exchange rate. It's an assumption about uh, talent availability. It's every kind of assumption that becomes irrelevant two weeks after we submitted the paper. We know it's rubbish. The banks are not stupid. They must know it's rubbish. Why do we keep doing this? And my answer is, we're still believing that we're living in a long cycle world, and this is just a temporary thing. This short cycles will just pass, and then everything will go back to normal. And it's also because the alternatives are just not being invested in. I was recently writing uh, an article on flexibility and budgeting for Harvard Business Review to find a decent high quality, well-tested concept of adaptive dynamic budgeting that is excellent for cycle, short cycle world, that's incredibly difficult. There's almost nothing being developed and tested. And I can say the same about finance field, as I can say about strategy field, as I can say about OB field, as I can say about marketing field, 
almost all theoretical underpinning. There are a few beautiful exceptions, beautiful. But in terms of the mainstream, we are behind the reality and our teams are feeling it. The fatigue is at the highest Gallup poll of 2022. We've never seen this, this much fatigue. And why are we fatiguing? Part of it is because we're creating a false kind of psychological contract with our people. We create a contract that change is the project. You guys, you know, buckle up, do this change one time. And then at the end, it will be all rainbows and kumbaya and we will hold hands and the unicorns will be dancing around it because it will be so glorious. And in a new short cycle world with a chaotic system, it's physically impossible. We are lying. We're setting up our own employees to fail. We are creating a psychological contract we cannot maintain. And we are not doing enough work to address this new reality. So I invite you to do this exercise at home. Think about what kind of work design is needed for long cycles versus short cycle. Think about what kind of role of OD professional was in the long cycles and short cycles. Add any questions you want. But I invite you to do this uh, on the back of a napkin just to do a little audit for yourself as you will discover a lot of opportunities to grow and to bring us to a close in the next four minutes and three minutes because I need to give it back to Pat. The crucial piece of information is all of it, in all of it, that we need to also root ourselves in is that most of change in development in the past, especially change, development was in some places preventative, in some places ahead of the curve. But change most of the time was, you know, don't fix it until it's broken. And data here is very clear. If you start reinventing on the decline side of the cycle, if you are in a red category, the wonderful research, the book called Stall Points, um, you can just Google it or you can Google it, um, Harvard Business Review's article on uh, reinventing before it's too late. You will see immediately when you are reinventing on the right side of a cycle in a red zone in the decline, the chances of you coming back to your peak historical performance are only 10%. If we are reinventing when the cycle is already fallen, when the budgets are already shrinking, when the fear is already running through the whole system, when the political will is not there to make difficult decisions, the chances of us to come back to peak performance are relatively, relatively low. This study shows that it's only 10%. That means we need to reinvent before we reach the peak. And that's where our work as OD professionals becomes crucial because all of it is about mindset and culture. It's about changing the assumptions. It's about creating a healthy relationship with change. And it's creating a culture where fixing before things broken is the norm and not the other way around. That is where a lot of resistance comes in. That is where a lot of failures with buy-in are coming in. And that's where we invite you to go next. I want to give it back to Pat. I want to mention a few resources as I hope this stirred some of your thinking. And of course, I will stay for extra time um, after the hour for those who want to stay, can stay. But if you want to continue this conversation, we do have a lot of resources for you to continue. On our end, we have uh, Easy Reinvention Lab coming up. This is a five-day event we hold every few months. It's free, it's online, it's on Zoom, it's only one hour a day, it's very easy to participate, but this is the place where we can go from theory to practice as we do some exercises, as we do tools and so on. I will put it in a chat and of course, happy for you to grab the copy of the book where all of these references are. So I'll put all of them in the chat as well. And let me pass it back to Pat, wonderful to be with you and I'm happy to stay a little bit extra after the hour. Thank you. Although we are approaching our formal closing time, as Nadia said, she's graciously agreed to leave the webinar room open for those of you who want to stay on and continue this connection. This session has been recorded, so you will be receiving the link to view, uh, and you're, you're welcome to share it with others as well. I hope to see all of you online next month when the Thought Leader Series brings you the updated and renewed version of rampant narcissism, loss of motivation and engagement, and deteriorating mental health with Richard Boyaxis. 
I will post our website link in the chat for those who wish to register. Um, so with respect to everyone's time, I want to end this by just my heartfelt thanks to Nadia with an open invitation to come back and visit us anytime. It was an inspiring presentation. And I want to thank all of you for joining us as well. My pleasure. I was just taking a screenshot of all your kind words, guys. This is amazing. And of course, I know you need to go. So go. And those who wants to stay, please do stay. If you have some questions, I'm happy to give more pointers or answer anything else. And you can type up or um, I don't know if the system lets you. You can also raise your hand. And if you raise your hand like this, I can see you immediately because there's a hundred of us here and it's easy for me not to see that you raise your hand. So um, questions, comments, happy to see the Empath alumni. I, I had the pleasure of teaching an Empath a long time ago, 15 years ago. This tells you a little bit about my age. A uh, long time ago, yeah, I had the pleasure of teaching in the program and um, OB department is my home, right? So I met my husband. I had the birth of my daughter in Rainbow Babies Hospital across the street. Cleveland is my home. So extremely, extremely proud of Case Western and all the work we are doing as a global graduate alumni community. My invitation to all of us is to take the call of our time and start forging forward a new set of theories and then therefore the new set of practice. In the sense we're doing it, um, that was the goal of Reinvention Academy. And I'm very thankful that about 5,000 people all around the world are helping us develop tools, improve tools. For example, we have one tool, the, the agile strategic planning uh, tool called Stellar Canvas that is now in version 14 because people take it to the industry, they give us feedback, we improve it and so on. In the download that I shared, if I didn't share, let me share. It is in that download. Uh, it's the last tool in the download. So you can test it out and send us feedback, help us develop it further. But most important, I think the call of our time as a field is we are living in a, in a new world and we can come up with a theory in which we are not afraid of change. We are not fighting turbulence. We are not constantly hating on chaos, but we are working with the conditions of a system as is. So I see some hands. Ravi, you will be first and uh, I'm happy to, uh, to, to have you here, so. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it was absolute, uh... Uh, Lee, fantastic to hear you. You you put magic in your words, and uh, it comes from a deep within uh, uh, feelings plus actual research. Now, I want to share with you one simple observation. I have also I'm in New Delhi, India, but I advise uh, companies in Europe and U USA primarily. We have also been doing a similar analysis as to why the VUCA word, has it become more VUCA or less VUCA? You know, we started on the assumption that the external word exists only how you perceive it. It's the image in your mind, which is the word you see. In fact, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at also change. And we analyzed that if I was to pick up one simple, one single word to describe what you have mentioned, it is the inability to be aware of what is happening. And you put it very nicely, our past beliefs, assumptions, biases overwhelm us all the time. Let me ask some of you here, how many of you are breathing right now? Please raise your hands. Okay, well, actually, we are not breathing. We are being breathed. If it was left to us to breathe, we would have died long ago. And this is what I, I, I enjoyed listening to you. You gave me a lot of substance on what my research led me to. That eventually, ability... Awareness is one trait which 
will make vukas disappear from your mind and if it's not in your mind it will not be outside what's your reaction to it nat i absolutely love it and i think there is a, there is a visual that might helps that i think we leave out of change management so much and um i will pass the word very soon to my teacher because um peter whitehouse was on my dissertation committee and helped with a lot of things and i rem- want to recall the words of another teacher uh, ron fry who was on my committee as well as the chair um where we would talk about change a lot and the vuca was still showing up right this is 2001 2002 2003 we were extremely shaped by the terrorist attacks of 2001 asking ourselves what did our field do to contribute to the terrorist attacks and what can we do to create the world where that does not exist and one thing that is very painfully clear is that when we talk about change management it's very easy to speak about what needs to be changed because it's obvious it's obvious things that we don't like there are things that are maybe product is not working processes are not working the impact on the world is not working what we're not doing enough and uh, to a degree a priest of inquiry is filling some of that gap but it alone cannot fill that gap is the essence of change management is also continuity management it's managing what does not change what is the uh present what is yeah. the red line that connects across all cycles and when we are doing a lot of work on understanding the mechanics of change management the mechanics of continuity management and appreciative inquiry is one of the theories that is paying attention to continuity management what is the strength of the system how do we elevate and extend the presence the focus and the awareness and the presence is one way to elevate the quality of continuity that we provide because it cannot be left to its own devices it does not without the practice the continuity management does not how ha- happen we throw the baby with the bathwater to to speak metaphorically all the time because we are not present to separate baby from the water it just all crap to us we are fed up we are tired we burnt out we're done with this system no the the nature of the system when we were choosing the word why reinvention and not innovation with all my love to innovation is that part of it is renewal but part of it is continuity it's keeping the best of the past it's not throwing everything away so i'm with you completely and i appreciate your comment ravi wonderful to meet you great we'll be in touch thank you thank you ravi thank you peter you are next so happy to see you Indeed, Nadia. I just wanted to say hello. It's been lovely to be with you again. I've signed up. I've already received some of your automated uh, emails. Um, and uh, also, uh, just to say that this idea of the big picture of reinventing civilization does need to be grounded. And on February the 9th here in Cleveland, we're planning a big design meeting around uh, the theme of bioregionality. And uh, So I put that in the chat. Anybody interested in continuing some of the elements of this conversation and thinking about our own community who happen to be in the Cleveland area, peter.whitehouse at case.edu. And I, I look forward to seeing you again, Nadia. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. And uh, guys, uh, Cleveland is one of the one of the loves that I have for Cleveland is that that's one of the study of the city and community that goes through cycles quite visibly even in the time that i know cleveland it has done a few cycles of searching for itself and it is today a, a definitely a healthier a more life filled system than it was when i met it in 2001 and to see the glory of the turnaround and the humbleness with which this community approaches it is incredibly incredibly heartwarming so i do invite you to engage with cleveland uh even if you're just looking for inspiration and some practice great curtis you're next 
Great. Thank you. Cleveland rocks. I agree. <laughs> um, hey, I, I think you just alluded to this. You said this would be a whole nother talk, but I'm going to have you go there. What about, you know, to use your 75, six, put those side by side. I'm going to throw the question out there. What about higher education? You know, that space of uh, tenure and uh, all those classic things that they, they've grown very accustomed to, and they felt very protected and insulated in their long cycle world. And yet they've been majorly disrupted, obviously, a lot there. I would just love your thoughts on what needs to change, what is happening, uh, what are some positive things you're seeing, some developments in higher ed? It's a painful thing, right, for me as an educator, as a mother, um, I got to the point that I quit, right? In 2016, I was the Coca-Cola chair professor. There's hardly anything higher up that you can go in. A, and I was exec ed professor. There's nowhere else like this like golden place. And I couldn't handle it anymore. This constant fight at every academic meeting, Nadia, you are not publishing enough in the A-level journals. And the A-level journals at this point are the journals that only accept the type of research that can be completely non-debatable. And the only non-debatable research is the one that correlates spinach with green. There's no other type of research that can be non-debatable. Everything else, you can doubt the methodology, you can pick apart the approach, and you can say, no, this is not okay. So the, the, while the research is crucial, the issue is that our approach to research limits the topics we can study. I'll give you an example, love. And especially because yesterday was Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, day, and he was one of the most amazing theoreticians of love, speaking about love without power being anemic. I believe that our lack of research in love results in the fact that love becomes uncompatible and uncompetitive. We assume that in a fight between love and fear, love will win on its own. So love right now is poorly financed, completely unprofessional, highly inefficient. And in the contrast, fear and hate use the best tech possible, including artificial intelligence and machine learning. It's the best financed. It's the best in terms of skill set and on and on and on. And we don't have even space. If I want to publish serious work, theoretical work on theory of love in 2023, I would have to fight for nearly a decade to get that into any publication. So one is the field of theory. And then the second part is the field of practice. I went to a most beloved school, my home for my PhD program. But even in my school, I've got zero education on how to be a teacher. In a typical PhD program, they teach you how to research. You need to write a thesis. Nobody teaches you how to be an educator. So then those amazing kids or adults get their first faculty position and they know how to write papers. That's what they know how to write. If they're lucky, they may have a basic foundational theory on the philosophy of education and theory of education, but they do not have the practice. So some of them swim out and most of them don't. So that's the second problem. And the third problem, of course, are in the institutional issues that you discussed. This is the way the institution is set up. The tenure track was a great invention. In the long cycle world, this was invention against censorship. Why tenure track was created? So that if I am producing the kind of research that challenges the societal status quo, you cannot fire me. I am protected by the tenure track. I have done my due. I've prom proved that I'm a good researcher. I'm, I've done my work. Now I have a right to research what I want to research. But are we seeing the signs that this is still working in the new world? No, we are not producing meaningful research. At least we're not producing it in the world where this happens. There are sites, there are avant-garde. There's avant-garde work always happen. To a degree, you can think about the new capital work 
of Thomas Piketty as an avant-garde work, but it definitely was not produced by Matt. It was not came and coming out of Harvard, right? So same with our work. We are fighting to the bone to get published. Yes, we are publishing now in Harvard Business Review and Wall Street Journal, some of it in Forbes, but the fight to get there, to even question, because I'm shaking up the foundational strategy. I'm, I'm attacking Michael Porter, the, the, the holy grail. I'm, I'm questioning the essence of finance in finance, loan cycle world. Loan cycle world, that is great. You know exactly how you're going to pay. So debt to equity, excellent, borrow. Sorry, financiers in the room. I'm looking at Tina and a few others. Borrow. I mean, massively borrow. This is great. But in a short cycle world, debt to equity has to be rethought as a standard. And we're not doing it. And this conversation threatens that institution, including the institution of education. Of course, absolutely does. And the discomfort, what does it mean for my position? What does it mean for my mortgage? What does it mean for my uh, life? What does it mean for my comfort? It's a very painful disruption, discussion, but it is leading to where what we call the Titanic syndrome happens, which is killing ourselves. We're just sinking our own ship. And it's very visible by enrollment rates. It's very visible by uh, the youngsters who have an alternative now, and they're not interested. They are, And they're not stupid and they're not lazy. And I'm talking because I have a freshman in the house uh, who talks to me and her friends talk to me about their expectations from education. They're not lazy. They have a choice. And that's a different story. So I appreciate the question, Curtis. What's your take on education? Thank you. Well, having worked as a transformation person with, I, I, half my clients are higher ed and half are corporate. And mm -hmm. I love them both in different ways and hate them both in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. I worked a lot with university publishers over the years and you know some of the professional associations and they're lovely, I, they're brilliant, they're great. And and it's so hard to get them to think outside some of the the sort of their definitions of themselves. Mm -hmm. No, we are the musicological association and that's what we are. I'm like, but wait, there's this other thing going on right around you and they don't want to hear that information. So there's a lot of um, kind of biases that I, I see in those those departments. They, they can't uh, redefine I mean, themselves. Yeah. I mean, biases are not bad on their own. We would not right. be no, without biases, right? We we literally cannot live and work without biases. I I have a bias towards my floor. I assume it will not fall under me uh, on a daily basis. Otherwise, imagine how I would walk around the house if I didn't have a bias that my floor is safe. I mean, biases are very important. The issue is in a fast moving world, we need to refresh our biases with a extreme regularity and building that consistency in terms of organizational design and um, process design is a whole different approach. So uh, I know you guys need to go. So I'll take just two more comments. Thank you, Curtis. Nice to meet you. Uh, let's be super focused. James. Uh, if you oh, could you're voiceless. Yes. I know I'm your voiceless. Um, but that's because I've just crawled out of bed and went into a series of meetings starting at six this morning. Time zones, they kill you. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for your comments on Cleveland. Having been born in Cleveland and worked my first 19 years professional, I was in the 70s. I was in Cleveland when it was bottom. I mean, really bottom. So when I finished my DM in 2017, that was a whole different Cleveland um, than what I was used to. And it has the change that has undergone has been significant, I think Case's place in that helping that change happen has, is underreported and gives me some hope for maybe what I could do in Alaska. Um, I had two comments, one about uh, the short cycle aspect of change. So I'm trying to work on some research proposals in uh, you know, focused on what do we do with climate change, but in specifically in our rural and our, our, our Arctic communities, um, which are small, are far away, and um, significantly populated. They are populated by our um, indigenous peoples. Part of the issue is how do we absorb traditional knowledge in the research, which is not being done. There's are some just discovered some traditional knowledge research methodologies, but it's the short versus long cycle. 
Now, I'm thinking from a research perspective is, how do we change the mindset of traditional knowledge? Traditional knowledge is the knowledge of, of, based on millennium, of being in a region, based on their experiences, based on where the ice patterns have been for thousands of years. And now that change is going quickly. It's easy to go and say, well, obviously your traditional knowledge is worthless, which now you've just devalued an entire population. So how do you how would one deal with short cycle requirements of change in a culture that is based on indigenous and traditional knowledge of many millennium? Um, and that's kind of a, an interesting way to start. And then that's the real question. The other short question is on the aspect of governance is what can the government do? What can governance do to moderate the short cycle so that people can invest and make decisions in the short cycle because it's highly risk-based. Mm -hmm. And some of the stall comes the inability of any kind of safety net. And that includes jobs, medical coverage, the whole safe, social safety net thing. So, but really my big question is on the aspect of traditional knowledge and short cycle change, short cycles, change in short cycles. Um. I'm not the best to speak about it. Uh, my implication, my my knowledge here is uh, just based on uh, very very limited experience, including the experience of my own Aboriginal culture. Right, the Kazakh culture was not magic until about hundred years ago, and it's taken me a lifetime to discover how much of it is driving my life without me aware of it. So recently, we had a debate in Kazakhstan where I still try to do a lot of work to support the country on uh, our traditional knowledge. And for example, one of them, um, as a nomadic culture, um, for us, the concept of ownership of land or property is a sign of mental illness. Uh, the idea is that you do not own land. I'm sorry, you come and go. The land is here for thousands of years. What are you talking about? It's just, are you sick? Are you drunk? Are you hallucinating? What are you talking about? <laughs> and in that thing, uh, this leads to different set of behaviors, right? So the idea of developing land or building factories on our land is just not naturally landing to the local culture. This is not what local culture does. So the question for us is, how do we take that philosophical understanding and collectively develop a new set of behaviors that allow us to create financial and economic and ecological sustainability uh, without the offers that we have from the Western world that live in their paradigm, which is, you know, cut the land into pieces, give it peace to people, build factories, you know, the whole thing. It's just not what we do. And one of the things that we're looking for is taking the indigenous traditional knowledge and beliefs, applying it to a modern reality. So we already have the only regional Grammy winner. So the Grammy winner from the region of Eurasia, the only one is from Kazakhstan because oral culture is our natural state of being. So can we take what is our paradigm, which is you cannot physically own things, they own you, but you can um, create value in a different way. For example, singing a song is a value. Can we monetize that? Can we create sustainable livelihood out of that instead of forcing our people into economic model that is foreign to our nature? So creativity and creative arts, uh, including singing songwriting. Another direction is um, uh, visual work. So we now have some of our Kazakh producers who are producing music videos from the best of the best in Hollywood. Um, um, that has been the direction. Can we build the uh, whole community around visual arts, around sound, anything that is close to our natural framework instead of breaking all of this? breaking the southern tiers of knowledge and artificially imposing a set of behaviors that is not natural to our community. I don't know if that is referring, I don't have enough uh, knowledge and enough research here, but I think that is back to the question of the solution, the, the stability in a short cycle world comes from your red line. The What saves you is being extremely clear 
fully aware and hold on, holding on to the red line that does not change, that is non-compromisable, that is not breakable, and cultivating that and knowing very clearly what can come and go and what stays with us, including uh, some of the paradigm, uh, elements of the paradigm that we're just not ready to let go because we do not believe that Western uh, exponential growth own the assets, own the land, explore the, that this model, that this paradigm has proven itself to be sustainable. There's a lot of questions on that from the indigenous culture. So we just have not seen that your model work. We're not ready to accept it. No matter what IMF and other global financial institutions are demanding from our government, the local cultures just say, sorry, it just doesn't fit any paradigm in which we can exist. But I think that's a great, great question for further research and a, a beautiful conversation to have with the actual holders of the knowledge, which would be the indigenous leaders. I appreciate it. Thank Good you, Jay. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Risa, you will be last and uh, then we close. Thank you, everyone, for staying extra time. Risa? Maybe I mispronounced the name. Risa, Risa, Ratman? Maybe not. Maybe it's our, or maybe there's something with a connection. You're still on mute. Yeah. Risa, you on? Oh, the mic is not working. Okay. Then it's a, it's a sign that it's time to let each other go. It's been an honor. I hope uh, we stay connected. Uh, of course, I'm on LinkedIn. Grab the book. Try test things out and so on. Always happy to hear your feedback. Come to the lab if it resonates. Don't come to the lab if it doesn't resonate. Um, my always honor to come back to CASE. So I hope we will come back and see each other at other events of CASE Western Reserve. And thank you so, so much. I look forward to your takeaways. What does it all mean? So thank you. Thank you. Have a great day and uh, huge, huge hugs to all. Thank you, everyone. Great year ahead. Thank, Thank you, Raj. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.